photography and extensive experience in ultrasound guided intravenous access placement. His talk today will cover the topic ultrasound guided lines and tubes in neonatology. So please, and thank you very much for joining us. Thank you for your presentation and thank you, Dr. Pandita, for inviting me. I'm trying to share my screen now, see if it works. It works perfectly. Okay, thank you. So I'd like to uh, let you know that I am a member of the Italian group that uh, really do a lot of research on central venous access and this is uh, its uh, pediatric specialist group on uh, vascular access too. So I'm starting uh, you quoting this paper that I'm sure you have heard of. It, this is paper that has been endorsed by the uh, European Society of Pediatric and Neonatal Intensive Care. Uh, I'm using one of the table of this paper as a summary of uh, this talk. But before diving into the talk, um, I would like to show you this paper. They show you a little bit where we are about the use of point of care ultrasound. This is a survey that has been done in Canada in the last uh, couple of years. And as you can see, there is a quite nice diffusion on the use of uh, uh, ultrasound for cardiac assessment and in the diagnosis of cerebral condition. But when we look at uh, other aspects like the diagnosis and treatment of pneumothorax or about the uh, positioning of IV lines or deep location of several catheters that we use in an intensive care, you can see that the percentage is quite low. And the reason for this is maybe the lack of trained personnel. Uh, second reason is lack of equipment. But these are things that we need to be reminded when we uh, talk about these topics. So the first thing is that point of care ultrasound is useful to insert chest tube and to perform needle aspiration in tension, in tension pneumothorax, but it also useful to guide thoracentesis in neonates and children. And there is, as you can see, a strong agreement for that. So uh, what the paper that I quoted you before said is that lung ultrasound should not only be used to diagnose pneumothorax, but also to provide static guidance for pleurosynthesis. The evidence is coming from this quite nice paper that uh, probably you have heard yesterday that has been published by, by Professor Raimondi. So all the signs that we use to perform a diagnosis of pneumothorax have a quite high sensitivity and a quite high specificity. And then uh, point of care ultrasound is also useful for a guided thoracentesis. Um, the evidence from this recommendation is actually coming from adult study. And the benefits of using point of care ultrasound is that it reduces the risk of post procedural pneumothorax and increase your success rate. Another interesting point is the use of ultrasound for confirming the endotracheal tube in neonates. The potential benefits are the reduction in the exposure to radiation, the reduction in handling, and the possibility to determine the ETT tube position in the liver room. And this is particularly important when we want to give surfactant quite earlier. Uh, there is, a, however, a cochrane that suggests that at the moment there is insufficient evidence to recommend the role of the use of ultrasound in this regard. In fact, uh, the paper uh, endorsed by the European Pediatric uh, Society uh, does not recommend it. The reason is probably due to the fact that if we look at all the different papers that uh, have been published on this regard, uh, all authors use different techniques. And then there is another point that uh, in all the papers that have been published, there is a quite low incidence of esophageal intubation. So it's really, really difficult to assess how useful this technique is to distinguish between an endotracheal and esophageal intubation. However, from what uh, we can read from the uh, published evidence, probably 
the best method remains the measurement of the distance between the tip of the ETT tube and the uh, inferior margin of the aortic arch. So this is probably the best reliable method. When we look at the, uh, in a, a sagittal view, at the ET tube, we look at the tip and we measure the distance between the ET tube and the aortic arch. A distance more than one centimeter is a good predictor of good position. And there is this ongoing trial that is using a different approach and this about the use of transversal view but results are still pending. And then uh, we can use ultrasound for central line placement. And there is really, really uh, a lot of evidence about it. It's really a time for a soft revolution. There is this group that is the Pediatric Specialist Interest Group of the Association of Vascular Access that referring to uh, NICU uh, starts to speak about soft revolution. And there are three main aspects that we need to improve. And two of them are about the use of ultrasound. So which is the role of ultrasound IV access in preterm babies, especially if we compare this type of access to the conventional epicutanal caval catheters. And then how we can improve um, the training of healthcare specialists in the use of this technology. First of all, I want to focus on the nomenclature because it's really, really important. So the World Congress of Vascular Access five years ago clearly defined how we should call the central venous access. So when we speak about CICC, it's a central inserted central catheter that means catheter that are inserted from the neck or the chest. So it means catheter inserted in the internal jugular vein, the brachycephalic vein, the axillary vein and the chest. When we speak about femoral inserted central catheter, we are speaking about catheter that are inserted in the groin area. So for neonates, especially the common femoral vein. When we speak about peripheral inserted central catheter, we are talking about deep vein of the arms. So basilica and brachial veins, cephalic vein, axillary vein and axilla. ECC stands for epicutanal caval catheter, a small bore catheter inserted in superficial vein of the limbs. And this kind of catheters is the one that we use in NICU. So we should never um, refer to our catheter as peak line. The reason is that there is a rule. We should always, always uh, use a catheter that does not exceed one third of the external diameter of the vein. So the external diameter of the catheter should not exceed one third of the internal diameter of the vein. So considering that one French is 0.3 millimeter, it means that the free French catheter needs a vein of at least three millimeter. A four French catheter needs vein of at least four millimeter and the five French catheter needs a vein of at least five millimeters and so on. So the smallest peak catheter is a free French catheter. And there is this nice paper published on neonatology in 2019 that proved how there is no such vein in newborn. So all the veins of the arms, all the veins of the arms and the legs in newborn does not reach this cutoff of three millimeter. So it's actually impossible to place a peak catheter. On the other side, what this study proved is uh, is that almost every newborn has a brachycephalic vein of at least three millimeters. And this is very important. So peak catheter and the epicutanal cover catheter are two completely different devices. And there is this editorial that uh, Mauro Petiruti and me published on Journal of Vascular Access last year that clearly said that we should not call them Peak catheters. So peak catheters are the catheters that are used in children and adults. They are inserted in deep vein of the arms, 
with the ultrasound and they are cut uh, with a diameter of at least three French. And these are power injectable catheter. It means that this catheter have a high flow up to one, two milliliter per second. What we use in newborn should be called epicutanal cover catheters because they are inserted in superficial vein of the limbs under direct vis vein visualization. And they are small bore catheter, so one to two French. And they have a very low flow, which means one to two milliliter per minute. On the other side, what we can do now is place a ultrasound guided vascular access. And the two most common approach are the approach to the brachish phallic vein and the femoral vein. The brachish phallic vein is very interesting because it's easy to visualize. It's not dependent on respiratory variation and it has a large cross-sectional diameter. Femoral vein on the other side, it's ideal for emergency situation or when the neck or head are not accessible. So when we talk about CICC newborn, we talk about this high performance catheter that are placed in the jugular vein or the brachycephalic vein. And this is an example of a femoral vein. I'm really pleased to present to you this bundle that has been conceived uh, <clears throat> in Rome by Professor Mario Pittiruti, and there's been used in several paper. So I'm not going through all these steps, but I'm going to just point out the main things that uh, I think that are really, really interesting. So the first step is the use of ultrasound before the procedure. This is very important, and this is, should be done in a systematic way. So the rapid central vein assessment is a systematic approach for the evaluation of all the veins in the neck and the chest. The two most important steps for newborn are the evaluation of the internal jugular vein at the base of the neck and the evaluation of the brachycephalic vein. So step two and step three. So this is the internal jugular vein at the middle of the neck. And then you go down at the base of the neck and you can see the internal jugular vein. And then you um, tilting the probe, you can see the brachish phallic vein. The reason for doing this procedure is that there is no ideal site for cannulation. And we should always determine the best vein after an ultrasound examination of the available vessel. And we can do the same evaluation for the femoral vein, so uh, for the groin area. And again, the two most important sites are step one and step two. So the evaluation of the common femoral vein in short axis and the evaluation of the common femoral vein in long axis. Here you can see a quite nice picture of the common femoral vein. And here is a long axis of the common femoral vein. So why we should do this uh, protocol before the venipuncture. The reason is that we can choose the easiest vein and the easiest vein to be punctured is always the safest vein for our patient. Then we can measure the diameter of the vein in order to make sure that the diameter of the vein matches with the diameter of the catheter. And then we can exclude possible complications such as for example, thrombosis or fibrin sleep. Second step is of course, hand hygiene and skin and sepsis, and then ultrasound guided venipuncture. This is the basic of ultrasound guided venipuncture. So we can see a vessel in short axis or in long axis, and then we can orient the needle in two main ways. So the first one is where the needle and the probe are perpendicular. And so in this case, the tip of the needle will appear as a dot or the probe and the needle are on the same plane. So in this case, the needle is line. So this approach is called out of plane technique. And this approach is called in plane technique. The short axis uh, out of plane technique is the preferred approach in the venipuncture of the femoral vein. 
The long axis in plane technique is the preferred approach in the venipuncture of the brachycephalic vein. The reason for this is that when we puncture the femoral vein, we need the panoramic view. So we need to make sure that we avoid the femoral artery that is very close to the femoral vein. The reason to use the, the long axis in-plane technique for the brachycephalic vein is mainly due to the fact that the brachycephalic vein cannot be visualized in short axis. This is a picture of the brachycephalic vein that is being punctured with an in-plane approach. So again, this is quite a nice clip that I've done at my hospital. This is the uh, lungs, this is the pleura, this is the the right brachycephalic vein, and thus you can see the needle is coming in uh, the same plane of the probe, and you can see the needle and on, uh, in its whole length approaching the brachycephalic vein, and once you are into the vein, you can then aspirate blood. Usually it's quite easy to puncture the brachycephalic vein because it's a big vein. Sometimes it can be difficult, especially in preterm baby. But after uh, the venipuncture, we still use the ultrasound because we can use real-time ultrasound for tip navigation. So we can double check the direction of the guide wire and then the direction of the catheter to make sure that the catheter is going in the right direction. For instance, this is a picture of the guide wire going from the right brachycephalic vein to the left brachycephalic vein. So in this case, the guide wire is going in the right direction. And this is the micro introducer that you use for catheter placement. And this is the catheter itself. The fifth step of this bundle is the uh, evaluation of the tip of the catheter with the use of intracavitary ECG. I'm not going deep into the technique. The point is that we use the catheter as a lead. And once we identify the P maximum creep P wave, we are sure that the catheter is at the atrocaval junction. And then uh, it's quite easy to tunnel the catheter if we need. And this can be done uh, very easily using a cannula. And then the last steps of this bundle is the uh, care of the exit site. The, we constantly do using a sutureless device, using a channel high grade glue, and using a transparent semi permeable dead dressing. And these are three nice cuts that, that have been inserted with a venipuncture of the brachycephalic vein and they've been tunneled to the infraclavicular area. And this can also be done in very low birth weight infants. This is a paper that, has, that uh, Mauro Pituit and me published last year. And this, uh, this bundle has been applied to preterm babies with a weight below uh, 1,500 grams. Uh, as you can see, uh, gestational age is quite low, 26 weeks. And the mean dwell time of for the catheter was 37 days. All catheters were electively removed. No case of infection, no case of thrombosis, no case of malfunction. And what are the advantages of this approach compared to a picotinal cover catheter? So the advantages is that when we place a central inserted central catheter, we can use a power injectable catheter. So a largest catheter, three or four French catheter. So it means that we can have a higher flow rate, up to one, two milliliter per second, compared to the low flow rate of ECC. And we can uh, so uh, take blood sample, we can do hemodynamic monitoring, checking the central venous uh, pressure, checking the mixed uh, saturation in the venous blood. Uh, we can tunnel the catheter, we can use uh, ECG for tip location, and we can keep the catheter uh, for an extended well of time. These are all the studies that have been published about this approach. And as you can see, the success rate is very high, up to uh, over 90%. And there is actually no complication. And then the last part of this talk 
is about the catheter position. First of all, we should always, always verify tip location before catheter use. And for this reason, Infusion Nursing Society recommend to use real-time technique. So we should always double check tip location during the insertion procedure. In adult and children, the use of intracavitary ECG is uh, the gold standard. But for several reasons, it's not feasible in preterm babies or, or, or for epigutan cover cancer. So what, is, what, what happened around the world is uh, most neonatal intensive care units use conventional X-ray for determination of tip location. But why we want to use ultrasound? The reason is that chest X-ray is inaccurate. So when we do a chest X-ray, we can visualize the catheter tip, but we do not visualize the vessel. So we assess the position based on other radiological landmarks, such as vertebral bodies, the cardiac silhouette. Then second point, chest X-ray is a post-procedural methodology. And third, it's not harmless. So what, how we can do the procedure in a different way? We can do real-time ultrasound. And this is the insertion of a UVC. You can see the catheter that is approaching the ductus venosus. And here is going the IVC, and here the catheter is in the right atrium. And then we can pull back the catheter to the right position, and then we can do a flash of normal saline to confirm that the position is correct. This is a very easy procedure. It's been reported uh, from several others, and you can see the tip is visualized in 100% of the cases. And what is also interesting is that about 25% of the catheter that looked in a good position at the chest X-ray were not in a good position at the ultrasound. And that's because, as I mentioned you before, chest X-ray is inaccurate. This protocol uh, is about to be published on Journal of Vascular Access in the next couple of months. And it's a, a comprehensive pro protocol about the use of ultrasound for tip location. So about the use for umbilical venous catheter, we suggest a tip navigation protocol using a subcostal longitudinal view. So during catheter insertion, we can visualize the catheter into the umbilical vein, the ductus venosus, and the IVC. And this is not a static procedure. This is a dynamic procedure because sometimes, as you know, the catheter failed to reach the target zone. The reason for this is that there is this, uh, um, this angle between the umbilical vein and the ductus venosus. So using ultrasound, we can perform a compression and, and line up the umbilical vein, the ductus venosus, and the IVC, as this clip sh is showing to you. So without compression, this is the ductus venosus. And as you can see, with compression, there is a very nice lineup between the umbilical vein and the ductus venosus. And then, we do the tip location protocol, which is the assessment of the final position of the catheter at the junction between the IVC and the right atrium. And as I mentioned before, we suggest to do a flush of normal saline. This is our view. So this is the umbilical vein, the ductus venosus, the right atrium. This is the position of the probe. It's a subcostal longitudinal view. And this is the clip and the flash of normal saline is coming, which show us clearly that here is the tip of the catheter. We also suggest to use ultrasound for the tip location of epicutanal cover catheter. The reason, which is the correct position, the one on the right or the one on the left? As I mentioned before, we cannot see well where the, uh, a junction between the superior vein cave and the right atrium is. So we should do an ultrasound. 
ultrasound is accurate in this more specific um, than chest X-ray. And again, we can do a tip navigation so we can follow the catheter through all the vessel. There are several protocols that have been described and they've been published. Uh, and you can actually see the, all the small vein in the newborn. And you can see the brachycephalic vein and follow the catheter from the brachycephalic vein into the SBC. This is a nice picture of the left brachycephalic vein in a tiny newborn. And then for tip location, we suggest to use a small sectoral probe. And since we are visualizing very small catheter, we suggest to do at least uh, three different windows. So the most useful are probably the subcostal longitudinal view, the four chamber apical view, and a long axis view of the SVC. So this is a bicolor view, subcostal longitudinal view. You can see the IVC, the right atrium, and the SVC. This is the apical view showing the right atrium and the right ventricle. And this is a long axis view of the SVC. And here you can see a clip of our catheter. This is the catheter going from the SVC into the right atrium. And we can do the same procedure for catheter inserted from the lower limbs. Uh, we can evaluate the fem common femoral vein uh, and we can evaluate the catheter uh, into the IVC and then at the junction between the IVC and the right atrium. Here you can see quite nicely a catheter going from the IVC to the right atrium and here is the tip of our catheter. And the way, again, we can do a flash of normal saline to identify the tip of the catheter. So this is the summary of the protocol that I've showed you, but it's about to be published on JBA in the next couple of months. So uh, you can email me if you want uh, the, the study. And just uh, the last slide to remind you that uh, this is our evolution. We are going from stethoscope and to conventional